Our transport systems touch all aspects of our lives and the economy. Transport technology and infrastructure has allowed us to travel and move goods and materials with unprecedented ease all over the globe. But that mobility comes at a price. Transport is one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases, responsible for around one-fifth of total global emissions. And those emissions are growing faster than any other sector. The, the biggest challenge with this is that over 95% of the whole transport system is still fuelled by fossil fuels. When you take a lot of developed economies around the world, the transport system is the only system of the economy which has tended not to have reduced its emissions so far. So to do the things that we need to do to get on the, the, the pathway, the trajectory that the Paris Agreement is telling us we need to be on, we've got really a decade to at least halve the transport emissions from, from the transport sector. We need to act fast, but solutions must be engineered around the transport sector's most important component, the people who use it. Transport or travelling is what's known in the jargon as a derived demand, i.e. you don't really travel for travelling's sake, you're travelling to do something, to access something, to buy something, to go to work, to visit friends and family. That makes transport, I wouldn't say uniquely, but certainly very challenging a thing to tackle and, and to try and change because ultimately you're changing things which are essential to, to people's functioning in everyday life. In this episode of Getting to Net Zero, we're going to look at the crucial role of people in transport systems and how that needs to shape the engineering solutions for reaching net zero. Greenhouse gas emissions from the transport sector have more than doubled since 1970. Road travel, mostly in the form of passenger vehicles like cars and buses, is responsible for three quarters of that. The rest comes from aviation, shipping, rail and freight. In discussions about creating a net zero transport system, a great deal of focus is placed on using technology to decarbonise these vehicles. The overwhelming emphasis is on technological solutions in transport. And in terms of passenger transport, the overwhelming emphasis is on electric vehicles. But then something that concentrates the mind. If tomorrow, 100% of new car buyers bought electric vehicle and we're only up at around 10% globally maximum. But if 100% from tomorrow switched to being electric, it would still be 15 years before every single car on the road was electric because that's how long it takes to renew the fleet. So this means a very long, slow, incremental change which we just cannot afford to be placing so much reliance on. At the moment, I think the mindset is there's a technology change. We change the fuel, we change the networks, I've been talking about that, um, and so on. That's a kind of technology change, and somehow or other by doing that you'll kind of fix it. But actually that isn't going to fix it. Technology is a vital component of reducing transport emissions, but it is not enough on its own. The technology choices we make need to account for the dynamic nature of transport needs, and the social and economic impacts need to be considered as part of an integrated net zero strategy. So what does that look like in practice? Where transport infrastructure has built up over decades, local people and economies come to rely on them, making changing those systems complicated. It's important to recognise there is no one-size-fits-all solution. But one framework to help us think differently about reducing transport emissions is the avoid, shift, improve hierarchy. The first priority in this hierarchy is helping people avoid the need for transport altogether, when possible. That can be done with smart infrastructure and town planning that places people's needs – work, shops, education, etc. – within easy reach of their homes. The next most important action to take is shift. When we can't avoid travel entirely, we need to shift from high emission journeys to low carbon alternatives. This might mean switching more journeys to public transport, to lower emission vehicles or to active transport like walking or cycling. 
So it's saying, how can I do what I need to do by walking, by cycling, so that actually when I have to use some kind of mechanised motorised transport, actually it's because I have to. When we can't avoid or shift the high carbon journey, we then improve. This means preventing as much of the environmental cost as we can through engineering. This can mean making modifications to engines or vehicle designs to make them more fuel efficient, which is particularly important for large planes and ships for which low carbon alternatives are not yet available at the scale required. But it can also mean getting the most out of the existing transport infrastructure. There's a lot of embedded infrastructure, so railways would be a very good example, uh, very hard to move. Um, you're not you know, we're not going to realign all the metro system to go around the city instead of going in and out of it. So, so they're probably the, the most environmentally sustainable thing to do is probably leave them where they are. The Avoid, Shift, Improve framework challenges us to ask the big question first. What do we want and need from transport? Before asking, how do we all switch to electric vehicles, for example, you'd ask, what needs are we addressing with transport? How could those needs change or be changed? And having reframed the problem, what solutions and outcomes do we want to work towards? Asking bigger questions and thinking creatively about the problem can lead to transport solutions which are also socially and environmentally transformational. Medellin, the second largest city in Colombia, is located in a narrow valley of the Andes with the poorest neighbourhoods, or barrios, situated on the steep slopes above the river. In the early 1990s, the city was experiencing a crisis of violence, spilling over from conflicts within the narcotics economy. One thing that is important to understand is that during the 80s and 90s, because the violence, you cannot go out to the street. We lose the public space, we lose the city, the urban condition of the city, and all the places start to be like enclaves, you not know, protected, the public schools on the barrios behind fences. At this time, the barrios communities were largely isolated from the more prosperous districts. People would travel down the slopes for work, but the journey was long, congested, expensive and often dangerous. So the question at that time was how could we move forward in relation to integrate, include and reconnect the city. The first step the city took was to build a metro system through the base of the valley. This gives accessibility to the main axis, but to, to have accessibility to the houses, to the slopes, to the neighbourhoods, the city started to think in other possibilities. And that was the reason because the, the idea of the teleferic or the gondolas appeared. Medellin's gondolas are a system of cable cars built around the city's initial metro system that today provide mobility and opportunity to previously isolated communities. The system is powered from Colombia's electricity grid, so mostly low-carbon hydroelectricity. It also prevented the need for some fossil fuel-powered vehicles like cars and buses, which would otherwise have emitted 70,000 tonnes of CO2 in just the first six years of the gondola's operation. But as well as being a sustainable design, these transport projects have helped transform the city as a key part of a wider campaign to make Medellin a cleaner, safer, more accessible city for its inhabitants. The community was deeply involved in the process. We start to identify priorities with the community in relation to with the barrios, how a mother goes from the very early in the morning, take the kids to the school and then move to the work and take the cable car station. There is a network as well of library parts that the city developed in, with these cable car stations and uh, cultural centres. Involving the communities directly in how the cable car system was designed and executed has made for a more robust and sustainable solution and demonstrates how building a tailored transport system can be core to a wider programme of social transformation. And the transformation continues. Since the gondola's installation, Medellin's cable cars have since been joined by another innovative transport solution. Solar-powered escalators zigzagging across the hillsides now link the gondola stations to other inaccessible parts of the city, 
allowing even more of its inhabitants to enjoy the benefits that come with increased mobility. Medellin's problems have not evaporated overnight, but it's a very different city today to how it was 20 years ago. It's clear for us that those programs and projects that has more sustainable conditions and, uh, and has the possible to grow and to expand uh, 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 were those projects that uh, from the beginning has a, mo a more robust and more inclusive participation and engagement of different partners and community. We can only reach net zero if all the connections between technological solutions and the people and environments they interact with are understood. In this series, we've seen how buildings connect to the material world, how energy connects to economy and how transport connects people. A systems approach to net zero is fundamentally about changing these things together so that a separate strategy for one system, like energy or housing, doesn't constrain the transition of others like transport. It's a simple idea, but as we've seen, this broad and inclusive approach can produce exciting results, allowing us to find the best engineering solutions to support lasting system change on the journey to net zero. Join us next time as we get deeper into what else is needed from policy, people and engineering to get to net zero.